so there we go. All right. Uh, so, you know, New York City is uh, is noted for having historic architecture in the United States, uh, but throughout the 20th century, a number of really very prominent buildings uh, fell to the wrecking ball. Uh, so we're we're going to look at those buildings that fell in the in the 20th century up, but we're also going to look at some earlier buildings too that no longer exist. Um, you know, uh, one of the things about the United States is we have sort of an obsession with newness, uh, right? That um, that not all all societies have, and that has been something uh, that unfortunately means that sometimes, in the name of progress, we take down things that maybe we shouldn't have taken down. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so we're going to explore some of those tonight. Let me just uh, share my screen because, uh, of course, I have pictures to go with this. Um, all right, and uh, as uh, as Nancy said, feel free to drop in questions in the chat, and at the end, I'll make sure that I look in the chat and answer questions. Uh, so if anything comes up as we're going along, please feel free to to drop those in. And so we're we're going to begin uh, actually right here with this building. Uh, so this is the site uh, and what will become uh, the original Madison Square Garden. Uh, so this was originally, though, the site of the depot for the New York and Harlem Railroad. Uh, now, the railroad closed this depot in um, and moved up to 42nd Street in 1871, leaving this site. Now, P.T. Barnum leased the site from the owners of the, uh, the former depot, the Vanderbilts, uh, and uh, Barnum built this building in 1874 and he named it the Great Roman Hippodrome. The building was, as you can see from the drawing, an enormous open air arena that measured 420 by 200 feet. And in this, uh, Barnum staged circuses and other performances for over two years. In 1876, he decided to vacate the building and he leased it uh, to another entertainer, this was a band leader named Patrick Gilmore, and Gilmore renamed it Gilmore's Garden. And in that capacity, it hosted many events, uh, flower shows, beauty contests, music concerts, uh, large rallies. In particular, it was noted for holding a number of rallies for the temperance movement, which was gaining steam in America at the time. And it also hosted for all you dog lovers, the first ever Westminster Kennel Club dog show in 1877. Now, in 1879, the Vanderbilts took control of the land and the building back. And uh, uh, that was William Kissam Vanderbilt. And they did a little bit of renovation to it, as you can tell. And they renamed it Madison Square Garden. And of course, uh, folks, it was called Madison Square Garden because it was on Madison Square. And now in this, um, in this capacity, it hosted national conventions, indoor track, boxing matches, which drew thousands. Uh, P.T. Barnum actually leased it again in March of 1882 to exhibit Jumbo, an elephant that he bought from the London Zoo for $10,000. And it became one of the most important facilities in the United States for bicycle racing. Uh, the late 1800s saw America in a bicycle craze. But by 1889, this roofless arena was certainly showing its age. Harper's Weekly called it a patched up, grimy, drafty, combustible old shell. Uh, so it was very hot in the summer, it was cold in the winter, and it never turned much of a profit. Uh, so in July 1889, Vanderbilt sold the garden to a syndicate that included some of America's most prominent men, including J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, James Stillman, and William Waldorf Astor. They commissioned then the well-known architect, Stamford White of McKim, Mead, and White, to design them the second Madison Square Garden. And here you see a wonderful uh, tinted postcard uh, of the second Madison Square Garden. This was built with a huge budget of $500,000 and Sanford White lavished upon this building 
uh, an elaborate Beaux art style that had a Moorish influence to it. Uh, the second garden featured a 32 story minaret like tower that you can see, of course, prominent in this, in this uh, postcard here. And at the time of its completion, this tower was the second tallest building in New York City. So now while the outside um, uh, was a riot of architecture, it was crowned with a very famous sculpture. So crowned with a statue of the Roman goddess Diana by none other than one of America's most famous uh, sculptors, August St. Gaudens. The statue was made of gilt copper. Uh, she stood 18 feet high and weighed 1,800 pounds. And in fact, uh, she spun in the wind. Uh, so she was a huge weather vane. But uh, owing to her commanding spot at the top of this huge tower, she dominated Madison Square. And so Madison Square was nicknamed Diana's Little Wooded Park. Uh, she was put in place in 1891, but Stanford White, uh, the designer, actually thought that she was too large and she kind of threw off the proportions of the tower, as did St. Gaudens. So she was removed just two years later in 1893, and she was sent to Chicago to be exhibited at the Chicago World's Columbian Exhibition, where she stayed until, unfortunately, she was destroyed in a fire. Uh, however, fortunately for us, a couple of copies were made, and so you can see one if you would like at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, and there is also a copy at the Met. There are uh, uh, some other uh, small uh, casts of the, her around the country as well. Now, the interior uh, was enormous, as the exterior, uh, you could have guessed from the exterior, so um, here is the, an interior shot from 1905 of one of the auditoriums. Uh, the new building opened on June 6th, 1890 with a program in the main arena that was attended by 17,000 who have paid up to $50 for their tickets. The main auditorium of the building uh, was a 200 by 300 foot hall, which was the largest in the world at the time. It had permanent seating around it for 8,000 and could fit thousands more on the floor uh, when chairs were added to the floor, which uh, typically was for things like political conventions, which were hosted at the garden. The last uh, great convention, political convention that was hosted at the garden was in 1924. That was the Democratic Convention, which nominated John W. Davis for president. Uh, some of you who are, um, uh, students of presidential history may know that that is the longest ever political convention. The Democrats were deadlocked that year and the balloting went for over 100 ballots until they finally compromised on John W. Davis, who went on to go to lose to Calvin Coolidge. Uh, the garden also featured a 1,200 person theater for theatrical shows, a 1,500 person concert hall, and the largest restaurant in the city, which became quite famous, as well as a rooftop garden and cabaret. Uh, it continued to host the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. It also hosted uh, horse shows, circuses, musicals, light opera. Bicycle racing continued to be popular at this garden as well as boxing matches. And it also hosted the first ever indoor professional football game in 1902, when it hosted what was called the World Series of Football. Here's an image from 1900 of the rooftop garden. Uh, so rooftop gardens were very popular in New York City at this time. Many prominent hotels had rooftop gardens, as did a number of Broadway theaters um, in Times Square. Uh, without a, a doubt, though, the most famous, or I should say infamous event that happened at the garden was when a mentally unstable millionaire, Harold K. Thaw, walked up to Stamford White, the architect of the building, who was having dinner on the roof, uh, in the rooftop garden, and shot him at point blank range 
killing him. So on the left, we have Harold K. Thaw. Thaw was heir to a $40 million coal and railroad fortune and had a history of mental instability. He became obsessed with Evelyn Nesbitt, who you see on the right. Uh, she was considered one of New York's great beauties. She was a famous chorus girl and model. And she had been Stanford White's mistress prior to being wooed, and courted, and finally married by Harold K. Thaw. She uh, confessed to Thaw the relationship, uh, and uh, they wed on April 4th, 1905. However, Thaw, after the wedding, became fixated on this affair that White had with his uh, wife. So on the evening of June 25th, 1906, uh, he was spending an evening in New York City with uh, his wife, and they bought tickets to go see the show called Mademoiselle Champagne on the rooftop of Madison Square Garden at the Cabaret. At 11 o'clock during the final number, he calmly walked across the, gar the rooftop garden to Stanford White, who was sitting with a group of friends watching the play, and shot him three times at point blank range, exclaiming, I did it because he ruined my wife. Thaw was arrested for first degree murder, but found not guilty by reason of mental insanity. The garden continued to function until 1925 in this building when it was torn down uh, for a skyscraper, the new headquarters for New York Life Insurance Company. And a new Madison Square Garden was built in a new location. So this is the third Madison Square Garden, uh, which was opened in 1925. This is the first Madison Square Garden that was not built on Madison Square. Uh, this one was located on 8th Avenue between 49th and 50th Street, and it was designed by a very famous theater architect named Thomas W. Lamb. And it was built for a cost of $4.75 million. It officially opened December 15th, 1925, featured a very large arena, 200 by 375 feet, with a capacity of 18,000 spectators. However, despite being designed by a famous Broadway theater designer, it was known to have terrible sight lines and such bad ventilation in this building uh, that in this era of indoor smoking, a layer of smoke hung over uh, the top of the auditorium and the top tier of seats when, the, when it was filled to capacity. Uh, this continued to host the Westminster Kennel, uh, Kennel Club Dog Show and major sporting events as the previous gardens did. Uh, however, this one never uh, actually hosted a major political party's uh, campaign, but it did have a number of prominent events that have, have become uh, famous in history. So on the left, you see the anti-Nazi rally, which was hosted here on March 15th, 1937 in response to uh, Nazi Germany's growing uh, anti-Semitism. The American Jewish Congress and the Jewish Federation uh, uh, Jewish Labor Committee sponsored this huge rally uh, to uh, encourage Americans to boycott Nazi Germany. Uh, among its prominent guests were Mayor Fiorella uh, LaGuardia. And it was in this Madison Square Garden where, as you can see in the picture on the right, Marilyn Monroe famously sang happy birthday to President Kennedy at a birthday party, which was hosted for him here on May 19, 1962. More than 15,000 people attended this event, which was a fundraiser for the Democratic Party. Uh, this version of Madison Square Garden was torn down in 1968 after the new and current Madison Square Garden opened, uh, which uh, was opened on the site of another famous building that we're gonna talk about later in this, uh, this presentation. This building is another entertainment venue. This is the New York Hippodrome Theater, which stood from 1905 to 1939. Uh, so in June, 1904, construction was started on what was billed as the largest theater in the city. This was located on 6th Avenue between 43rd and 44th Street, just outside of the Times Square Theater District. And it was the brainchild of two men Frederick Thompson and Elmer Dundee, 
Uh, you may have heard of them because they owned the highly successful Luna Park at Coney Island. So they were in the entertainment business. The building uh, was uh, brick, mar brick and marble. And again, this one, uh, like the second Madison Square Garden was inspired by Moorish architecture. Uh, it also host, uh, featured uh, elephants, carved elephants in keystone as the keystones in arches. And you can see one in the large arch in this photograph. You can just make out the, the large elephant head in that arch. Uh, the interior of the theater was enormous. Uh, it opened on April 12, 1905 to a sold out audience. It could accommodate 5,300 people in the audience. The stage was 12 times larger than the average Broadway theater stage and could accommodate as many as 1,000 performers. Uh, the stage had multiple trap doors in it uh, as, and could also accommodate an 8,000 gallon tank that could be raised from below using a hydraulic lift for aquatic shows. Over 22,000 electric lights were needed for the stage lighting and over 100 stagehands were required to run a production on this stage. Uh, the main auditorium, although these are uh, black and white, but the main auditorium was decorated with red as the prominent color with accents of gold, silver, and ivory. And there were ornate uh, lobbies outside that were made of marble. The opening show for this theater was a four hour extravaganza called A Yankee Circus on Mars and featured about 1000 performers in the cast. The Evening World newspaper reported, quote, a magnificent spectacle, savage in its gorgeousness, as well as refined in taste. Everyone in America should go to the Hippodrome. It hosted during its time as a theater, some of the most famous vaudeville stars of the day. Uh, and uh, also Harry Houdini, who famously made an elephant disappear in front of an amazed audience in this theater. The Hippodrome was uh, quite profitable until the mid, uh, mid to late 1920s, when then owing to its large size, it was very difficult for it to turn a profit. It finally closed on August 16th, 1939 and was demolished. An office building currently stands on its site. So we've covered two entertainment buildings. Uh, now we'll go uh, to look at a famous commercial building. This is the Singer Building, which was completed in 1908 after two years of construction. At 612 feet tall, this was the tallest building in the world from 1908 to 1909. It was commissioned, uh, as you may have guessed from the name, by the Singer Sewing Machine Company uh, as their new world headquarters. They chose Ernest Flagg, who was a prominent Beaux-Arts architect to design the building. And he designed a 12 story base, as you can see, and a much narrower tower that only occupied about one fourth of the, of the lot that Singer built on. Uh, this was because Flagg believed that it was the responsibility of architects and owners of tall buildings uh, to not uh, completely block out the sun for neighbors. So they should only build narrow uh, towers to allow light and air to get down below. The New York Daily Tribune, Tribune reported on its construction, the Singer building is to be the one that the visitor to New York will go to see on their first day in town. It will be 36 stories high, but what makes it yet more remarkable is the fact that 25 of these stories will rise up like a tower. His design was called by some Second Empire Baroque, and was quite lavish with its detail, as you can see in this tinted postcard. At every seventh story on all four sides of the tower were cast iron balconies supported by ornamental brackets. The window openings were decorated with iron railings and scroll designs. The building was of red brick and North River bluestone for the window sills and was trimmed in limestone. Even before it was completed, it was famous. Uh, just a year into its construction, on August 29th, 1907, the Prince of Sweden was visiting and asked to be taken to the Singer Tower. 
And indeed, he was taken up in the then unfinished Singer Tower to have a view of the city. Although it was not admired by all, the New York Globe called it an architectural giraffe. The interior was just as lavish as the exterior. Uh, so here on the left, you see the main lobby of the Singer building. Uh, the entrance was through 24 foot high uh, bronze doors. Uh, the main lobby was a spectacular affair. Marble columns and walls were decorated with cast bronze molding and 80 bronze medallions that bore the trademark of the Singer Manufacturing Company at the top of the columns. You can see those, the oval medallions at the top. The elevator doors, railings, balconies, and the master clock for the building, which you can see on the staircase landing there, were all made of bronze. In all, 38 tons of bronze was used to just decorate the lobby. The executive offices for Singer were on the 34th floor of the building. And you can see on the right, uh, an original photograph of one of the executive offices here, oriental rugs, custom furniture, and finely carved woodwork uh, surrounded the executives in uh, opulence. There was an observation tower, which opened on July 1908 and proved to be a popular tourist destination for many, many years. In 1961, the Singer Sewing Machine Company decided to move and they sold the building uh, to US Steel and the Singer Company moved out and moved up to Rockefeller Center. US Steel had no intention of keeping the building. Uh, it only lasted a few years after that. They demolished the building in 1968 to build a 54 story high rise called One Liberty Plaza. Until 2001, this was the tallest building demolished in the world. So next we're gonna look at some residential uh, that is no longer with us. So this is the home of Cornelius Vanderbilt II. Now you may know of Cornelius uh, because maybe you visited his summer home, his cottage, which is the Breakers in Newport. This is his New York City home. In 1877, Cornelius Vanderbilt, the founder of the family fortune died, leaving 5 million to his favorite grandson, Cornelius Vanderbilt II. In 1878, Cornelius II bought and demolished three brownstone houses on the Southwest corner of 57th and 5th Avenue he commissioned noted architect George B. Post to design him a house that would stand out. And Post created a vast red brick and limestone chateau with turrets, intricate dormers, deeply arched windows and ornate chimneys, as you can see here. Unfortunately, very little survives of the original interiors of this mansion. Uh, some of the most prominent artists of the day worked on the interiors, including uh, John Lafarge and August St. Gaudens, who designed this eight, 11 by 15 foot mantelpiece. Uh, the piece is now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, so you can still see it there. Uh, it depicts two marble caryatids representing Pax and Amor, peace and love, supporting the mantle. There is a mosaic over the uh, fireplace, as you can see there. And that has a Latin inscription that was composed by Vanderbilt himself. And it reads, the house at its threshold gives evidence of the master's goodwill. Welcome to the guest who arrives, farewell and helpfulness to him to depart, who departs. So despite the enormous size of this mansion. And again, keep in mind that he bought three brownstones. So three families once lived on the site that now his one family lived in. Um, by the early uh, 1890s, his father had died leaving him an additional $67 million. And also by that point, a number of other mansions were built that rivaled his in size and stature. So he decided to enlarge his home. Uh, so on the right of this photograph, you can see a number of brownstones behind the mansion. Uh, that's Fifth Avenue, by the way. Uh, so the right street is Fifth Avenue. Um, and he bought 
those five brownstone houses. So he now owned the entire frontage of Fifth Avenue from 57th Street to 58th Street. He had those five homes demolished and commissioned George B. Post to come back and design an addition to his home. Ground was broken on this addition on March 1st, 1892, and he wanted the home finished as soon as possible and gave the builder just 18 months to complete the work. As a result, there was a crew of 600, sometimes working by electric light through the night to finish construction. The Times reported in 1893, uh, when construction was nearly done, that this was the quote, finest private residence in America. It is a structure that would command admiration in any land of palaces, castles grand, for in its design, its noble proportions and its artistic finish, it is in reality a palace. And indeed it was. So now we're looking at the new side of the mansion. So at the left of the photograph is actually the original mansion. You can see the little turrets and all of this huge building that is facing us is the addition that was designed by George B. Post. So the mansion now had 130 rooms over four stories, making it the largest private home ever constructed in New York City. Uh, it was modeled after French chateaus, as you can tell, and was ultimately completed at a cost of around $3 million. The family entrance actually remained at the original on the other side of the house on 57th Street. So that was the entrance that they used daily. The entrance that we are looking at here uh, was what was called the ceremonial entrance. And it was only used when the Vanderbilts were uh, entertaining and having uh, lavish parties. Uh, so you can see there's a large uh, porte cochere here uh, that of course would shield you uh, when you were getting out of your carriage should it, there be inclement weather. Uh, the interior was completely changed and redecorated by Jules Allard and filled with antique pieces purchased in Europe and shipped over for the house. Uh, St. Gaudens spectacular man man mantelpiece, which we saw earlier, uh, was no longer on the entertaining floor. It was now moved up to one of the family rooms up on the second floor. Um, it was no longer grand enough for the new house. The, in uh, the uh, main floor of the house was dominated by a huge entry hall that you see here. It was 40 by 50 feet, and it actually soared three stories up into the home. Uh, it was all done in con marble. And the focal point, as you can probably tell by these photographs, was an or ornate spiral staircase that gave access to the rest of the home. Uh, the ground floor featured many rooms for entertaining, including a watercolor room where the Vanderbilts would greet guests during formal functions, a grand salon, a petite salon, a drawing room. Here on the left, we have the Moorish smoking room which is complete, as you can see, with a, an ornate chandelier. The walls were encrusted with tiles and mosaics and the floor piled high with Persian carpets. On the right is the Vanderbilt's dining room, which also doubled as their art gallery. They had a sizable art collection. Uh, the dining room could seat dozens of guests for a formal dinner. And uh, here, in their art collection hung two Turners, uh, one constable and a work by Rousseau as well. And of course the home was built for entertaining and featured a large ballroom. Uh, the two story uh, 64 by 50 foot ballroom could accommodate 600 people and had doors that accessed the salons on the first floor to provide ease of movement when they were entertaining. Uh, there was a, a Parisian um, artist who painted the ceiling. A critic remarked, Cupids frisked about, darting their love shots about rather carelessly. The Vanderbilts lived happily in their mansion until the morning of September 12, 1899, when Cornelius died at the age of only 55 in the mansion. He left his wife, Alice, $7 million, uh, the New York mansion, and their summer cottage, the Breakers. She continued to live in both houses. However, she never entertained on a large scale and the ballroom was never used again by her. 
By 1925, the neighborhood that this mansion was built in had changed dramatically. So here on the right, you can see the Plaza Hotel. And in the center is the Cornelius Vanderbilt II mansion. Still large, but now dwarfed by high rises. Um, Alice continued to live in the style to which she had been accustomed with this house fully staffed with 37 servants. However, by 1925, this way of life was ending. Her trust fund generated $250,000 a year, but that was not enough to run both houses. Taxes on the breakers in Newport were 83,000 a year and taxes on the New York mansion were 130,000 a year in 1925. When it was built in 1890, taxes had only been 38,000. So she sold the mansion to Bergdorf Goodman Department Store, which demolished it and built their new store where it stands today. Now, certainly we know Fifth Avenue as an address for prominent New Yorkers, but there were other areas of New York that were uh, equally as prominent and also had really dazzling architecture, uh, residential architecture. And one of those is on the other side of the island. And here we have the Charles Schwab mansion called Riverside. So Riverside Drive on the west side of Manhattan uh, was also a popular place for the wealthy to build. The Schwab mansion occupied an entire block between 73rd and 74th Street on the Upper West Side that he had purchased in 1901 for a whopping $865,000. He hired a French architect to design him a French Renaissance chateau that was inspired by the chateaus of the Loire River Valley. Construction began on, in 1901 and lasted six years um, for it to be completed. So here we have another view. This is looking at the backside of the mansion. So you see Riverside Drive uh, in the front there. And then of course the Hudson River is beyond. Now the block contained more than just the mansion. In addition, it held a garage for four automobiles, a separate building for receiving and processing of shipments uh, to the house, a manicured French garden that you can see part of here. And there was also a tunnel under the garden from the processing uh, center so that uh, when the servants brought things over that they had unpacked, they didn't disturb the family that might be using the garden. The interior was equally as lavish as you would expect. Uh, the mansion itself was 75 rooms. And uh, this uh, you can see is the main uh, hall, the main stairway. The mansion had a belfry, belfry with chimes, an indoor swimming pool, a chapel, uh, but the stock market crash of 1929 ruined Schwab. And by the end of the 30s, he was almost penniless. He was no longer of, able to afford the taxes on Riverside. And he offered the residents to the city of New York to serve as the mayor's residence. Uh, Gracie Mansion had not yet been purchased by the city. Um, on hearing about this, Mayor LaGuardia, who was uh, known to be very uh, thrifty, uh, reportedly balked, what, me, in that? Uh, so he turned down the offer of the mansion. And as a result, it was demolished and replaced by a brick apartment tower that is called Schwab House in honor of the mansion that used to be there, but is certainly not ornate at all like the mansion that was once there. So uh, now we'll get into some uh, another form of residential, and that is hotel. Uh, so on the left, what you are looking at, folks, is the Waldorf Hotel. Uh, this is on Fifth Avenue, on the corner of Fifth and 33rd Street, um, and it opened on March 13th, 1893. It was constructed by a millionaire named William Waldorf Astor on the site of his former mansion. Um, so he tore down his mansion, and he moved further up Fifth Avenue and he built a hotel. He built it in part as revenge against his Aunt Caroline who lived next door. He, his wife had a spat with Aunt Caroline. And so you can see in the right photograph, Caroline's mansion is still there. And now she has this huge hotel next to her. Uh, the hotel was constructed in what was called the German Renaissance style by Henry Hardenberg, uh, who was the architect. 
Uh, you may know him for his design of the Dakota apartment building. Uh, the 13-story hotel uh, was built at the cost of about $3 million. It featured 450 guest rooms, almost every single one having its own private bath, uh, which was a luxury unheard of at the time. And because of uh, all the bathrooms, and also because it was so much further up Fifth Avenue than the commercial area had spread to, people initially referred to it as Astor's Folly uh, because they didn't think that this would be successful. Uh, however, uh, they, they were proven wrong. The uh, first year, the hotel made $4.5 million. So it was an enormous success for Astor. The interior, here you have some original shots of the original Waldorf Hotel. Uh, so on the uh, left is the main reception room and on the right is the ladies reception room. A total of $800,000 was spent on interior decoration and furnishing of the hotel. It featured 15 public rooms that were modeled after European uh, styles of decor. Uh, the main reception room that you see on the left featured bronze capped columns and hand stenciled ceiling beams. And the ladies drawing room uh, was according to the times, a perfect reproduction of an apartment of Marie Antoinette. One of the most famous features of the hotel was an interior garden court with fountains and flowers and uh, also a restaurant that became very well known in the city, so well known it was uh, a rival to Delmonico's and Sherry's. Now his aunt Caroline attempted to ignore the noise and traffic that the hotel brought to her mansion uh, and remain in her home where she had lived for 40 years. But by 1894, she gave up and her son, John Astor, announced that he would build a hotel on the site of his family's former mansion called the Astoria. And so now we have the completed Waldorf Astoria Hotel. So Hardenberg was brought back to design uh, the Astoria side of the hotel. And he designed a 16 story building, as you can see in a very ornate uh, architectural style. And it was connected to the Waldorf Hotel next door by a famous hallway called Peacock Alley. Uh, so uh, this connected both uh, many of the prominent entertaining rooms of both hotels. Uh, the hallway was lined with columns of Sienna marble that were topped by solid brass capitals. The color scheme of the hallway uh, was of uh, salmon pink with cream and pale green accents. The hotel also featured a very large ballroom that was decorated in the Louis XIV style of architecture. It was three stories high and measured 65 by 95 feet. But by the 1920s, this hotel had become dated and high society had moved further uptown up Fifth Avenue. The Astor family chose to close the hotel on May 3rd, 1929 and build a new Waldorf Astoria further up. The hotel was sold to developers who tore it down to build the building we know today as the Empire State Building. So this is probably one of the um, most famous buildings to be demolished. Uh, and what you are looking at folks is the original Pennsylvania Railroad Station. So this station took up two city blocks from 7th Avenue to 8th Avenue and 31st to 33rd Street. The building was a huge structure of 788 feet long, 432 feet wide and covered approximately eight acres. Excavation alone for this site took years to complete and cost millions of dollars. It was designed by the famous architectural firm, McKim Mead and White, who I talked about earlier regarding Madison Square Garden. And it was opened in 1910 by the Pennsylvania Railroad. The station was a monument to Beaux-Arts architecture. There were two grand carriageways on either side that looked like uh, temple fronts. They were actually modeled uh, after the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. So you can see those in the photograph, the, the porticoed 
entries, those are carriageways. So carriages and automobiles would actually go in the, into them. Uh, the North carriageway served the Long Island Railroad, which was the commuter train, and the South served the Pennsylvania Railroad, which was the long distance train. Uh, when it opened, it had a capacity of 144 trains per hour on 21 tracks and 11 platforms. There were initially 1,000 trains scheduled every weekday, 600 for the Long Island Railroad and 400 for the Pennsylvania Railroad. It was a huge success. This is the main waiting room for the Pennsylvania uh, Railroad Station. It stretched the entire width of the building from 31st Street all the way up to 33rd Street. It contained uh, benches, there were smoking rooms off of it, newspaper stands, telephone booths, and uh, baggage and ticket windows as well. It was inspired by the ruins of the Baths of Diocletian in Rome, and lower portions of this were clad in travertine marble. It was the largest indoor space in New York City when it was completed. And indeed, it was one of the largest public spaces in the entire world. The concourse, uh, conversely, was very modern. It was all glass and steel. So this is the main concourse uh, of uh, supported pointed arches done in steel. One critic commented that Penn Station was large enough to hold the sound of time. Uh, however, uh, as, as many of you probably are aware, following World War II, um, uh, the push by our government was not to subsidize train travel, but was, of course, to subsidize automobile travel uh, with the creation of an interstate highway system. Um, and so that cut into train traffic quite a bit. And then, to make matters worse, passenger jets uh, became a thing in the 50s. Uh, that really decimated long distance train travel. And companies like Penn's, Pennsylvania Railroad could no longer afford these enormous buildings. And so ultimately they sold the building, uh, the rights to this building, and it was demolished. So here you have a photograph of the station uh, while it is being demolished. Uh, so people did try to save this building. Uh, they protested with a cry of don't amputate, renovate. Uh, and it had some prominent uh, people, including Jackie Kennedy, who advocated for saving the station. However, demolition ultimately began in 1963. Uh, and this is where the current Madison Square Garden now sits. Pennsylvania Station is still there. It's essentially in the basement of Madison Square Garden. If any of you have ever traveled through Penn Station, which I have, uh, you know that it is not a grand affair like the pictures we just saw. One architectural critic remarked about it that in the old Penn Station, one entered the city as though they were a god. In the current Penn Station, one scurries in underground as though you are a rat. And we'll end tonight with another entertaining uh, entertainment space for New Yorkers. Uh, this is the old Metropolitan Opera House. So this is known as the Old Met. Uh, it was located at 1411 Broadway and occupied a block between 30, 39th and 40th Street. It was officially opened on October 22nd, 1883 with a performance of Faust. It was made of yellow brick, and because of its more industrial appearance, instead of looking like an opera house, it was nicknamed the Yellow Brick Brewery because of this. The auditorium was significantly damaged by fire uh, in, on, in August of 1892 after just nine years, but it was rebuilt uh, and in 1903 received another major renovation by the famous architectural firm of uh, Carrier and Hastings. Uh, who you may know because they designed the main branch of the New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue. Uh, they redecorated the auditorium in a very sumptuous style and also a very ornate proscenium arch, which you can see uh, in the picture here, and then a close up on the left, which featured names of famous composers, including Mozart, Beethoven, Wagner, and Verdi. Uh, the auditorium was lavished with gilt and had a very, very famous sunburst chandelier that you can see here at the top of the auditorium. 
Uh, it could seat 3,625 with 244 in standing room. Uh, the first two tiers of the auditorium were originally private boxes, but in 1940, the auditorium was altered to keep up with the changing times and the second tier of boxes was removed. The auditorium was known for its excellent acoustics. However, by the early 1900s, it was already known to have a backstage facility that was really inadequate for the lavish operas it was putting on. Uh, during productions, in fact, stage crew would have to stack scenery uh, on 39th Street uh, outside of the stage door because they didn't have enough room backstage. Uh, there were proposals over the years to build a new opera, uh, but none of them came to fruition until finally the development of Lincoln Center. Uh, and that is where the current opera house is on the Upper West Side. So on April 16th, 1966, the final performance was held at the Old Met. It was La Boheme. And what you are looking at, folks, is a picture that was taken on the stage looking out into the Met on that final performance of uh, at the Old Metropolitan Opera House before it was ultimately de demolished. And uh, certainly, I could go on. Uh, there are many other very interesting buildings in New York that unfortunately are lost to us to history. Um, but I have already reached the, the limit of my time. Uh, so I'll open it up to questions um, and maybe uh, hopefully I'll have some answers for you. But I hope that you enjoyed what I put together uh, of the buildings that are lost to us from New York. And let me open up the chat, okay. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. Um, so uh, someone has asked what became of the, the marble, the furnishings, the fixtures when these buildings were demolished. Um, some of the mansions, uh, they had they had auctions, you know, to auction off the furnishing. When Alice Vanderbilt left that mansion, she was moving to a mansion, but a much smaller mansion. And so, you know, um, family inherited pieces, some pieces were sold, some people of course, some pieces were donated. Um, to the Met, uh, which is why the fireplace is there today. Uh, so it really does depend. Uh, some, some, fortunately, some pieces were salvaged. So for example, the eagles that once graced Pennsylvania Station, a couple of those have survived. So it just depends. Some things were kind of lost and other things survived. Um, and it, it just depends on the building, you know? Yeah, but that's a great question. Um, and so, yeah, you can see various things, uh, you know, in different parts of the country or different parks or things like that or in different museums. Oh, thank you. I'm glad that I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Yes, it is sad that so much was lost. I agree. Are there any? Oh, okay. Oh yeah, the automats. Yeah, you know, when I did my research, I found some really cool pictures of those, right? Um, yeah, so the automats were like, uh, they were a cafeteria essentially. And you um, put your, your coins in and, um, and you could open the door and then take out uh, your meal. And they were known for their pie. Apparently their pie was like super delicious. Um, and the automats, a number of them did survive right into the 70s. Uh, there was a prominent one near Times Square, I guess that was really popular among entertainers, uh, actors and actresses who would um, be in the Times Square theaters. They would, they would meet there and, and have lunch or, or dinner. And I think that one in particular because it was open 24 hours. So they could go there after their shows, uh, which I think is pretty cool. And that one survived into the 70s. But yeah, um, you know, there's uh, there's definitely some great information online about the automats if you if you look into it. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's there's some site I'd have to find it again, but it's like a fan site uh, where people post stories about their visits to an automat. Uh, but yeah, really cool. Uh, there was a whole chain of them in New York. Yep. And and I did consider adding those, but my lecture was already too long, so so I had to cut somewhere. You know. Anything else folks are wondering about? All right, well, I, I guess not, but I hope that I piqued your interest um, to explore more of Lost New York. There's a couple of really great books out there about 
lost New York. Um, and I bet that your librarian, Nancy, could track a couple of them down for you. Um, so thank you very much. Um, oh, so for the building materials, it, it um, the high rises and things like that, those were, those were American. Um, in terms of the interior decoration of those mansions though, lots of those were imported from Europe. Like the, the wealth of New York and, and of America in general, they would literally buy old rooms from you know, famous like uh, country homes in England or France and they would just crate them up, including the paneling, the ceiling, the crown molding, all of it. They crated it all up and they just shipped it over and put it in their mansions. So marbles, yeah, so they would have some uh, American, uh, some imported marbles from Europe, of course, because it was it was prominent to do so. Yeah, right? it was more expensive. So it really did depend again on the mansion. Um, yeah, but some had some would bring in, you know, French marble or Italian marble or something like that. So, and uh, let's see, what about the boroughs? Oh yeah, I mean, I didn't even get into the boroughs uh, because there was just so much in Manhattan. I could do another one just on you know lost Brooklyn. Um, are you know lost um, lost queens? Absolutely. There's there's like I said, there's a lot out there on demolished buildings um, in New York City in general. <clears throat> in terms of the laborers, you know, I don't know. Um, my research, I didn't I didn't find out necessarily about the laborers. That's a really good question, though, Phyllis. Uh, so I'm not sure if you know the laborers were were brought in um, specifically, you know because um, like I, you know, some, if there was like Italian plaster workers that were brought in or something like that, I, I'm not sure. It'd be something uh, that would be interesting to hear. Uh, so the Flatiron Building, it's, it's certainly one of the most famous skyscrapers in the US. Um, it actually it came a little later. It comes in the early 1900s. It's designed by Daniel Burnham, who, um, who is a very famous Chicago architect. And Burnham had already designed a number of skyscrapers at that point in his career. And you may know Burnham because he took the lead on putting together the, the World's Fair, the uh, 1893 World's Fair. So he was in charge of the Great White City, essentially. Um, so yeah, he's a really interesting guy. And then, and then he designs the Flatiron Building later. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a famous building, but it's, uh, it's not, it wasn't even the tallest one in New York City. It's just, I think it's famous in part for its shape. And also it's quite beautiful, you know, and it's been, um, it's just a, a very photographical, right? It's um, photogenic, I guess, right? Um, but yeah, there were a number of other skyscrapers already uh, before the flat iron. Yes, I agree. Um, I, like I said, I could do a whole other lecture on, um, on some of the boroughs uh, that have been lost. I. I am going to start creating some more lectures uh, in response to this one, because this one has been quite popular. Right now, I'm actually finishing my dissertation for my uh, doctorate. So once that's done, then I'm going to, um, then I'm going to finish, get started on some lectures, some other lectures. Uh, so that's something. Also, I think I'm going to do a lecture on um, uh, uh, nightclub fires, because um, America has had a number of really famous, infamous, I should say, nightclub fires. And so I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to put together a lecture on that too. Um, let's see, asking how Campbell came to have his own apartment in Grand Central Station. I don't know the history of that, the Campbell apartment. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't know. I know that there, there is uh, the history there and I think it's a bar now. Um, and there used to be like a, a tennis, uh, tennis court in Grand Central and stuff like that, but I'm not sure the origins of Campbell uh, and the apartment there. Indeed, uh, Grand Central could be a whole other lecture. All right, uh, looks like maybe that's it. Okay, well, uh, folks, I do hope that you enjoyed this tonight. Thank you so much for coming out uh, to the lecture. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for the invitation. Uh, I very much appreciate it. And um, hope maybe I'll be invited back in the future. I might see you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. That was really great. And thank you all for coming. What a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nancy. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>